A very common problem in pediatrics is uh, fluid in the middle ear. Uh, and we get reports back, uh, the kid has uh, some loss of hearing. Uh, it always bothers me when the reports are broken because the parents think that, ooh, the kid doesn't hear. What it really means is the fluid is making it difficult for the vibration to get which should be interpreted. And many times as you get rid of the fluid, the hearing is perfectly okay. I like better terms because the parents immediately think, oh, my kid's not going to, it's really not the case. So the question in my head is, uh, how much does fluid play in language development? And how much can you say, and what can you do to say the fluid is the reason, and underneath the fluid, it looks like the apparatuses are put together okay? Okay. How would you approach that problem? Well, uh, that's actually also part of every uh, standard hearing test. One, when we do behavioral testing, which is when we observe the child's responses to, to sounds, different frequencies, different speech uh, stimuli, uh, all kinds of auditory stimuli, one of the ways that we do it is through what's called air conduction testing. Air conduction means that the sound has to travel through the entire ear in order to be heard and in order for the child to respond to it. Um, if the child is old enough and willing, we'll put earphones in their ears or headphones over their ears um, and test each ear that way. If the child is too young or not tolerant, we'll have the sounds come through the speakers. That, those test results will take into account what the child hears with fluid because those sounds have to go through the fluid in order for him to respond. Um, but another part of the test is something called bone conduction testing, where we take those same frequencies and that same speech information, and we put it directly um, into the inner ear, into the cochlea. What that does is it serves to bypass the whole part of the ear where the fluid is and ask the question, what would he hear like if he did have fluid in his ear? What's his best potential for hearing? And we can expect in a typical case, in the overwhelming majority of cases, that once the fluid is gone, the hearing will go back to that level as long as it was normal before. There are some limitations to bone conduction testing in very young children, but it is a very good indicator. Uh, we go through different phases in pediatrics for, uh, was even a phase, of, they don't even have a tubes and the FDA was starting. They went back to it because they realized that if something interferes with the hearing, even though it's, maybe it's temporary, putting a tube in after we have watched the fluid stay there, most people are saying some places around four months, putting a tube, draining the fluid, obviously gets better speech development. And that's probably the best reason to put tubes in the first place. Is that true? Well, I think that a number of things are taken into account when a physician decides whether or not it's time to put tubes in a child's ear, because that's usually the last resort. We're um, talking four months. We're not talking walked in today and the kid's going to have surgery. We waited, yeah. we observed, yeah. we're very careful, yeah. proper treatment has been done, and we keep getting that persistent fluid problem in the ear. Mm -hmm. We're worried about the kid's hearing and developing language skills. We agree or disagree or different school of thoughts in audiology world? That that's the treatment of choice in yeah. a child with persistent fluid that's four a Four months, we're talking four months. Uh, I, I think that the American uh, Academy of Otolaryngology might say three months. Well, the, the, the time six is variable. Uh, six months, excuse me, three months bilateral, six months unilateral. But um, I, I do know that, uh, that pediatric ENTs take a number of, other things into account as well when deciding how aggressive they want to be about managing middle ear fluid, like with tubes in the ears. I know that one of the things they'll take into account is the degree of hearing loss. Uh, one of the things that they'll take into account is, is this child also sick from it? Is he, does he uh, you know, have recurrent acute infection where he has to be on repeat courses of antibiotics over and over again? Then also they'll tend to be more aggressive. They'll also take into account things like, is there any speech language developmental delay or risk for such thing? For example, um, children who are born with Down syndrome, for example, have a very high incidence of chronic middle ear fluid. Um, and are much, uh, no, nobody's likely to bother to wait even the four months, uh, you know, in a, in a child like that because they are so at risk for speech and developmental delays and so at risk for the persistent fluid in the ear. So there are different things that are taken into account. So it's uh, multi, for, multi factual things go into decisions such as get you walk in. I think it look. should be that way. I don't think that every child should be treated the same, uh, you know, without want, taking into account. Give the audiol give the ENT man and the pediatrician and family one particular facet. This is how much of a hearing loss, how persistent it is, is this adequate he hearing for developing speech, 
is part of your reports, is that true? Yes, it is. And, and as a matter of fact, we will always recommend uh, audiological monitoring of the child, regardless of what the ultimate decision is. If the decision is to put tubes in the ears, um, then we'll say come back two to three weeks after that and let us make sure that everything you know is back to normal and went away. If the decision is let's try medication, let's try a period of watchful waiting, uh, we will always say come back in four weeks or six weeks. Let's see if whatever it is the doctors decided to try has in fact borne fruit and, and worked. Um, actually, another thing that a lot of uh, physicians take into account is the time of year. It's much less likely that a pediatric ENT will recommend putting tubes in the ears early in the summer than it is, let's say, at this time of year in November or December. Um, because most children, even the ones that are sick all year, most children clear up in the summertime. And the older they get, with every year that goes by, the more likely their own ear will be able to overcome the problem, fight it off, and the older they get, the less likely they are to have this persistent type of problem.